Welcome to the Universal Relay F35 and F60 interactive learning course. This course is intended for those who are looking for an in-depth, step-by-step procedure to correctly configure the F60 and F35 relays for real-world applications. In the first section, we will start with a review of the basics of feeder protection covered in the Fundamentals of Modern Protective Relaying course. We will then move on to the second section, which is a brief review of the UR platform. The third section, which is the focus of this course, is the application of F35 and F60 feeder management relays, including settings calculations for the following protective elements. Phase time overcurrent, ANSI device number 51P. Phase instantaneous overcurrent, ANSI device number 50P. Phase directional overcurrent, ANSI device number 67P. Neutral or ground time overcurrent, ANSI device number 50N or 50G, and neutral or ground directional overcurrent, ANSI device number 67N or 67G. Due to the F60's support of directional elements, we will use the F60 menus when entering all calculated settings. Power System Components There are many sources of electrical power. Gas, nuclear, hydroelectric, and alternative. The electrical power that is generated by these sources must equal the power that is consumed. Let's take a look at a simple system consisting of a generator, steam turbine, prime mover and control system, and a residential load. As stated, the generated power must equal the demand which is constantly changing. As the load increases, the generators would tend to slow down, resulting in a reduction of output voltage and frequency. The generator's control system will sense this and input more mechanical energy to match the increased load. If the demand decreases, the generator will speed up. The control system senses this and then takes appropriate action to reduce the mechanical energy input into the system. Once generated, the voltage is fed to step-up transformers for transmission to reduce the I-squared R losses and then at the substation it is stepped down for distribution. Given that the power loss during transmission is equal to the current squared flowing through the transmission line times the resistance of the transmission line, the step-up transformer increases the voltage level thereby reducing the current resulting in an overall reduction of power loss during transmission. The Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, sometimes referred to as the IEEE, have divided voltage systems into low, medium, high voltage, and extra high classes. Low voltage systems are below 1000 volts. Medium voltage systems are between 1001 and 100,000 volts. High voltage systems are between 100,000 and 230,000 volts. And extra high voltage systems are considered to be any system above 230,000 volts. The voltage levels may vary in different parts of the world, but the names of the classes for the most part remain consistent. The three-phase power travels from the generating station over high power lines to substations. Different voltages are required for residential, commercial, and industrial customers, and so at substations, breakers and transformers route and step down the voltage to a suitable level for distribution. From the substation, the industrial or commercial power lines take the power above or below ground to a large transformer, which steps the three-phase voltage down to a suitable level for the plant or building. For larger commercial or industrial users, this voltage may be in the medium voltage range. In this case, there will be an additional substation on site. The power would then be routed from the transformer or transformers via medium or low voltage switchgear to different areas of the plant or building for further distribution via switchboards and panel boards. The power system can be thought of as a chain, the links of which are the generators, the power transformers, the switchgear, the transmission lines, the distribution circuits, and the loads. The arrangement of these links are as shown. The failure of any link destroys the capacity of the chain to do the work for which it was intended. One way in which the continuity of the chain can be preserved is to provide alternate links. For example, the transmission lines, being exposed to the natural elements, are much more vulnerable to short-circuit faults than the power transformers and switchgear. 
Hence, alternate transmission lines may be economically justified, whereas alternates for the power transformers and switchgear would not. The network of power systems now blanketing North America are often interconnected at various points to accomplish this. Since each link in the chain involves a large investment in equipment, alternates are frequently prohibitively expensive. To ensure both maximum return on the investment and to provide reliable service to satisfy customers, the whole power system should be kept in operation. This is accomplished in two ways. The first is by the specification of the design and the maintenance of each component of the power system to prevent a failure which would affect the component's usefulness in the power system. The economic considerations of design and maintenance procedures will allow this to proceed only so far. The second procedure which is followed is to control and minimize the effects of any failures that do occur. This is where the protective relay fits into the power system. The protective relay is the device which operates to disconnect a faulty part of the power system, thereby protecting that part and the remainder of the system from damage. The Function of Protective Relays Protective relays are placed on the system to reduce the number of alternate links to a minimum. They do so by avoiding equipment damage or by limiting it to the single component that may be in trouble. The relays quickly locate the fault and trip circuit breakers which will interrupt the flow of current into the defective component, thereby isolating it. Two benefits of this quick isolation are, first, it minimizes or prevents damage to the faulted component, thus reducing the time and expense of repairs, and permits quicker restoration into service. The second benefit is that the quick response minimizes the seriousness and duration of the fault's interference with normal operation of the unfaulted parts of the system, allowing them to continue to supply their normal power. In many cases, the unfaulted parts of the power system can supply the additional power to replace what was normally supplied through the faulted component. The protective relay uses current and voltage instrument transformers to acquire information about the system, such that a fault can be located. The type and location of the instrument transformers, the circuit breaker which is to be tripped by the protective relay when it operates, and the signal level required to operate the relay is selected when the relay is applied to the power system. The function of protective relaying is to immediately remove any component of a power system when it suffers a fault that might result in damage to property or unsafe conditions. In addition, protective relays can provide information on the locations and types of failures that occur. This information not only helps with equipment repair, but also provides the means for analyzing the effectiveness of the protection scheme. We should note that protective relays are not always part of a protection scheme. Fusing, reclosers, and sectionalizers are employed in some cases to keep costs down. Circuit breakers are located between each power system component, which makes it possible to isolate and disconnect the faulty component. If a breaker isn't installed between two adjacent components, both components will need to be disconnected for a failure in either one. One of the protection engineer's most powerful tools is the concept of zones of protection. The boundary of a protective zone represents the region that a particular protective element covers. It is necessary for these zones to overlap to ensure proper protection. If two zones did not overlap and a fault occurred at the boundaries of these zones, it is possible that no relays would be tripped. For failures within the overlap area, more breakers will be tripped than needed to disconnect the faulty element. However, the overlap areas are relatively small and the probability of failure in this region is very low. Therefore, the tripping of too many breakers for a fault in the overlap area will be infrequent. The preferred practice is that adjacent protective zones overlap around the circuit breaker, so that for failures anywhere other than in the region of the overlap, the minimum number of circuit breakers will be tripped. If the zones of protection are set up such that overlap occurs on only one side of the breaker, the relaying equipment of the zone that overlaps the breaker must also be able to trip the breakers of the neighboring zone in order to completely disconnect faults in certain areas. This can be illustrated in the following example. For a fault located as shown, the circuit breakers of Zone B will trip, but, because the fault is outside Zone A, the relaying equipment of Zone B will need to send a trip signal to the breaker in Zone A. A potential drawback of this is that the breaker in Zone A will be tripped unnecessarily for faults occurring in Zone B to the right of breaker C.
In general, the most common faults that occur on a power system are short circuits. We will now consider relays that are dedicated to protection against short circuits. There are two groups. The first group are called primary relays and are the first line of defense, while the second are called backup relays and function only when the primary relaying fails. Backup relaying can be classified as either local or remote. Faster reacting backup relaying can be achieved by using local backup relaying systems. This means that the relay providing the backup is located on the same component that is being protected by the primary relay. Local backup protection is often used to protect against failure of both the primary relaying system and the associated circuit breaker. The only potential drawback is that local backup relaying often uses the same CTs, VTs, circuit breakers, etc., which can fail, likely resulting in both the primary and local backup relay to also fail. Duplicate systems. On high voltage systems, it is a common practice to duplicate the protection systems to ensure proper operation if a failure occurs. In some cases, only the relays are duplicated, while in other cases, the entire protection system is duplicated. This is the preferred choice when economically justifiable. Let's take a look at several backup strategies being used within one power system transmission line. Here, we see that relays R1 through R6 are the primary relaying. The D group of relays is the duplicate system, and the L group of relays is the local backup relaying. When a fault occurs at location F, relays R1 and R2 are the primary relays that are programmed to identify and clear the fault. The fault at location F is within R2's zone of protection. Let's assume that when the fault occurs, R2 fails to operate. The duplicate relay, D2, should have operated at the same time. However, let's assume that relay D2 of the duplicate system has also failed. The local backup relay, L2, should now operate a short time after the primary and duplicate relays due to its coordination with them. If all three fail, the backup function of relays R3 through R6 is to provide remote backup to R2, D2, and L2. Let's look at an example of a breaker failure protective element. In this example, the protective relays operate correctly, but the associated circuit breaker fails to clear the fault because of some malfunction within the breaker or its control circuits. The fault will now remain on the system until some other means is used to clear it. In our example, the primary or backup relays start a timer once a fault has been detected. The timer will then time out and send a trip signal to all breakers that can feed the failed breaker with power. 